At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of what was known as the Italian Regiment. He and all his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. One day, at about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius. Cornelius stared at him in fear. What is it, Lord? He asked. The angel answered, Your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Now send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon, who is called Peter. He is staying with Simon the Tanner, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had gone, Cornelius called two of his servants and a devout soldier, who was one of his attendants. He told them everything that had happened and sent them to Joppa. About noon the following day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up to the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat, and while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven opened and something like a large sheep being let down onto earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals, as well as reptiles and birds. Then a voice told him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I've never eaten anything impure or unclean. The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and immediately the sheep was taken back to heaven. While Peter was wondering about the meaning of the vision, the men sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was and stopped at the gate. They called out, asking if Simon, who was there, or who was known as Peter, was staying there. While Peter was still thinking about the vision, the spirit said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you, so get up and go downstairs. Do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. Peter went down and said to the men, I'm the one you're looking for. Why have you come? The men replied, We have come from Cornelius, a centurion. He is a righteous and God-fearing man who is respected by all the Jewish people. A holy angel told him to ask you to come to his house so that he could hear what you have to say. Then Peter invited the men into the house to be his guests. The next day, Peter started out with them, and some of the believers from Joppa went along. The following day, he arrived in Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. As Peter entered the house, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet in reverence. But Peter made him get up. Stand, he said, I'm only a man myself. While talking with him, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. He said to them, We are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without raising any objection. May I ask why you have sent for me? Cornelius answered, Three days ago, I was in my house praying at this hour, at three in the afternoon. Suddenly, a man in shining clothes stood before me and said, Cornelius, God has heard your prayer and remembered your gifts to the poor. Send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He is a guest in the home of Simon the Tanner, who lives by the sea. So I sent for you immediately, and it was good of you to come. Now we are all here in the presence of God to listen to everything the Lord has commanded you to tell us. Then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know what has happened throughout the province of Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil, because God was with him. We are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on a cross, but God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by the people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen, by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him, and everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on Gentiles, where they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. 
Then Peter said, surely no one can stand in the way of their being baptized with water. They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. Amen. The title of my message is God accept from every nation those who fear him. Uh, key verses 34 and 35. So in Acts chapter 9, we learn how the reason Jesus changed Saul into Paul from a persecutor to a preacher. In today's passage, we learn how the Holy Spirit used Apostle Peter to begin fulfilling Jesus' world mission command to preach the gospel to all peoples on earth. So today, most Christians are Gentiles. Uh, for as a reminder, who is the Jew among, among us? Nobody. So Gentiles are non-Jews. In the beginning of Christianity, only Jews were Christians. Jewish laws of what to eat and what not to eat, along with their law not to associate with the Gentiles, closed their minds to share the gospel with the Gentiles. It was very difficult for Peter to overcome, who grew up with, with the idea that the Gentiles were only good for the fuel for the fire in hell. But God prepared Peter's heart by giving him a vision of unclean animals and said, kill and eat. Even today, barriers such as language, culture, education, personal prejudices, and race can all hinder sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I pray that God may destroy such barriers in our lives so we can freely and boldly share the gospel to anyone, anyone, even in our enemy, the Holy Spirit leads us, leads us to. Uh, first, God gave Cornelius a vision. So Acts, Acts chapter 10 begins by giving us a brief life description of Cornelius, the first Gentile the Holy Spirit chose to hear the gospel. Cornelius was a Roman centurion in the Mediterranean seaside city of Caesarea. So Caesarea is over there. Caesarea was the headquarters of the Roman government for the entire region of Palestine. So for example, P Pilate's house was there. So it was a military outpost. And it was populated predominantly by Gentiles with only a minor minority Jewish population. Mostly Roman soldiers were drafted from many of countries Rome had conquered. But the Cornelius was a genuine Italian centurion with 100 soldiers under his command. So Cornelius might have been stationed there for a brief time. So he would go back to Rome maybe in, after a while. Centurions like a Cornelius, Cornelius was the backbone of the Roman army. Cornelius, Cornelius must have been a well-disciplined Roman officer with the spirit and royalty of a Roman soldier. The world was a Roman world, and Cornelius was a Roman centurion. Humanly speaking, he was a lucky person. It seemed that he did not need anyone's help, and that he did not have to seek God. He could have claimed to be his own man. But to our surprise, Cornelius sought God earnestly until he learned of God Almighty from the Jews. His favorable human condition could not satisfy his soul. His soul was thirsty for the holiness of God. His soul was thirsty and hungry for the truth and, and grace of God. He was a pompous Roman soldier, but he longed for his heavenly father because he too was made in the image of God. Usually soldiers are very wild and they live a very wild living because you know, to forget about the present realities of war, killing and being killed and all the blood. And they, they enjoy drinking and uh, pleading pleasures of sin. But he was a very pious person. He was very different. He was 
he was a very good influence to his family members. Because of his good influence, his family members gave what was a devout and God-fearing. He was a blessing to people around him. Cornelius also gave generously to those in need. His love for God compelled him to love others. And he was also a man of prayer. Obviously, he learned how to pray regularly from the Jews. So in brief, he had a fear of God in his heart. He was a man of integrity. He was not far from the kingdom of God. Still, he needed to hear the good news about Jesus Christ in order to be saved. Because good life is not enough to save oneself. So once during regular afternoon prayer time, three o'clock, Cornelius prayed earnestly. Then God visited him in a vision. Look at verses three and four, three through five. One day, about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius. Cornelius stared at him in fear. What is it, Lord? He asked. The angel answered, Your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Now send men to Jaffa to bring back a man named Simon, who is called Peter. Cornelius prayed and saw a vision of God. There were many things to seek, such as becoming a captain. But he sought God. God saw this man Cornelius and told him in a vision to welcome Peter and hear the message of salvation. So here we can learn that God seeks those who seek him. Also, we, we can learn here that God does not use angels to deliver the message of salvation. God uses humans to bring the message. So in this case, God chose to use Peter to give the message to Cornelius. How wonderful it is that God works with us as his partners in his work. How wonderful privilege it is to be used by God as a God's instrument to bring the message of salvation. Second, God gave Peter a vision. About noon the following day, as Cornelius' servants were approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. So as usual, he was hungry. So if you look at the Bible, you can see that Peter was always hungry and he wanted something to eat. So while meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven open and something like a large ship being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals, as well as reptiles of the earth and the birds of the air. Then a voice told him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. So in this short phrase, kill and eat, God's passion for world salvation is dramatically revealed to Peter. So how did Peter respond to the voice? Look at verse 14. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. We understand why Peter protested. He was brought up in a society where food laws were strictly kept. So if you read uh, Leviticus chapter 11, Jews could eat only kosher food. So for example, any animal that has a split hoof and chew the curd would be clean. So for example, sheep and cows are clean. On the other hand, animals that walk on their paws like dogs or do not chew the curd like a pigs would be unclean. And also sea creatures such as a shrimp and lobster would be unclean. The creatures like these Jews were not only not to eat, but they were also not, not even touch, touch their carcasses. So God gave these laws to help them discern between clean and unclean and to live as a holy people in an ungodly world. So God wanted to separate them from the idolatrous neighbors because eating meals together is the most common way to mingle. So keeping these food laws was part of their identity as Jews. But because of these food laws, 
the Jews despised the Gentiles who ate all kinds of things without any distinction. They look at the Gentiles as unclean animals. So as long as this prejudice remained in their hearts, they could never accept Gentiles as human beings. So in order to proclaim the gospel of Jesus to the ends of the earth, Peter had to unlearn, unlearn some old habits and traditions of the Jews. So according to the voice, Peter had to kill and eat, but his stomach was too weak to digest all kinds of animals and reptiles wiggling on the sheet. So for example, if you are told to eat the snake, can you do that? How you will be repulsed? So even today, we find that accepting the food of other people is the best way to open a door to preach the gospel to them. So for example, when you go to France, you may have to eat the frog legs and snails. So you have to eat that to make friends with them. Many Canadians are horrified that some Asians eat dogs. They think that those dogs are barbarians. If they have that kind of attitude, they cannot preach the gospel. So when Sam went to Malaysia, he ate very spicy food and suffered from it afterward. But he won the affection of Malaysian brothers and sisters immediately. So what did God do with this man who had such a weak stomach? Look at verse 15 and 16. The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times and immediately the sheet was taken back to heaven. So in these verses, all kinds of animals represents all kinds of people on earth. Kill and eat man going to all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Peter need to change his outlook on the Gentiles. He need to see the Gentiles with the heart of God who loved them and wanted to save them. He need to root out the prejudice that was like a concrete wall in his heart toward the Gentiles. Peter need to rise above his own culture and traditions and learn that God accepts from every nation those who fear him. While Peter was wondering about the meaning of the vision, the man sent by Cornelius found Simon's house. While Peter was still thinking about the vision, the spirit told him to go downstairs to meet them and go with them without hesitation. So in this way, Peter and the man from Cornelius met together at the home of Simon. Peter was not really ready to invite them into the house as guests, but the Holy Spirit helped him to do so. Although Peter only thought about delicious food, God showed him a great vision of world salvation. Uh, third, God does not show favoritism. The next day, Peter arrived in Caesarea. As Peter entered the house, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet in reverence. But Peter made him get up. Stand up, he said. I'm only a man myself. There was a large gathering of people inside the house. Peter said to them, you are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure, unclean. So Peter overcame his prejudice and obeyed God, entered Cornelius' house. So we should learn from Peter his obedience. So we might not use the words impure or unclean as a reason to separate ourselves from certain people. Instead, it could be our own prejudices or cultural differences that keep us from separated from people. So we should demolish that kind of prejudice. Look at verse 33b. Now we are all here in the presence of God to listen to everything the Lord has commanded you to tell us. Cornelius' hunger for the word of God is remarkable. This pure motive to just to want to hear what the Lord would say should be our motive for attending Bible study, Sunday worship service, or any Bible-related event. When you come here, you must acknowledge that we are in the presence of God. We are in the presence of God. How awesome is that? 
our attitude be, should, should be our humble reverence. Listening to what the Lord has said to us should be our one and only motivation. So Peter was amazed at Cornelius' sincerity. So let's read the 34 and 35, our key verse together. Before meeting Cornelius, Peter thought that God showed favoritism, especially thought that God favored Jews over Gentiles. Now he could see that God is completely blind to race, culture, nationality, or whatever our human origin came from. There are only two things that God is not blind to, fearing God and doing what is right. So it was obvious that Cornelius feared God and was seeking to do what was right. God, therefore, was not deaf to his prayer or blind to his actions and blessed him with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So here, no two things. It does not say that God accepts everyone. But it says God accepts the, the one who fears him and does what is right. There is a condition there. God does not accept everyone unconditionally. Also, it does not say that God accepts everyone who believes in him. Many people say they believe in God, but they do not fear God. Even demons believe in God. He says clearly God accepts, only accepts those who fear him and do what is right. In Matthew chapter 16, 19, Jesus said to Peter, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So what he meant by that is that Peter, you will be the one who will unlock the door to the kingdom of God. So Peter used the key on the day of Pentecost for 3,000 Jews. In Samaria, Peter laid hands on Samaritans and they received the Holy Spirit. So again, Peter was the one who opened the door of the kingdom of God to the half-breed Sam Samaritans. So there was one key left in Peter's hand that hasn't been yet put in a door and turned. And that's the key that door opens the door to the kingdom of God, to the Gentiles. And Peter is about to unlock that the last door. And that is the tough key for Peter to turn because he has been raised in a whole lifetime, ingrained with this prejudice, ingrained with the legalism and nationalism. So this is a turning point in God's salvation history. Now the door of the kingdom of God is wide open to the Gentiles. As I mentioned before, the Gentiles were considered aliens, dogs, uncircumcised, and outsiders. They could not worship God at the temple. Actually, they could not even enter the temple. The term circum uncircumcised was an ethnic slur, similar to the names people use today for despised nationalities. But the Jews, for, on the other hand, spoke of themselves as a circumcision. This was a name of which they were most proud of. It identified them as God's chosen people and set apart from all the other nations of the earth. This kind of attitude crept into some members of the Christian community. They were called the circumcision party. They believed that the only way to Christianity was through Judaism. You could not get into Christianity unless you came through Judaism. And they made the circumcision the standard. Unless you had a physical right of circumcision, you could not enter into Judaism and you could not become a Christian. So that was their attitude. And if you read the Bible, St. Paul battled with this group the most. If this group had won, Christianity would have remained as a sect of Judaism and Christianity would not have spread to the whole world. But by giving the Holy Spirit to Cornelius without first becoming a Jew, without being circumcised, God demonstrated that he accepts Gentiles as they are. And St. Paul calls it a mystery. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 6, 6 says, 
this mystery is that through the gospel, the, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and shares together in the promise in Christ Jesus. So Jesus destroyed the barrier between Jews and the Gentiles and created a new community of people through his church. Through this new community, we all became fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household. So believers of Jewish ancestry have no advantage over them. Any one nationality have no advantage over the other nationalities. All Christians are first-class citizens of heaven. So in this passage, we learn that God accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. God opened the door of faith wide to the all Gentiles. So Revelation chapter 7, verse 9 says, After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the land. Indeed, God welcomed people of every nation. Even in our church, I count for people from 14 different nations. May God help us to overcome many prejudices toward others and demolish any other barriers that keep us from sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. So big idea is God accepts from every nation those who fear him and do what is right.